Welcome back to SIHH Live for another and the final session of the day. Uh, measuring time has always been a major concern of humans. Philosophers, astronomers, scientists, scholars of any kind have probed the stars, studied the light, developed ways to measure the passage of time uh, that were very different, but generally based on intervals, days, hours, minutes, uh, seconds. Now, modern science is pushing the quest much further. And uh, to talk about that, Urwerk, uh, who hosts this session, has invited a very special guest, a scientist, Gaetano Mileti, founder of a unique lab at the Université de Neuchâtel, the Neuchâtel University here in Switzerland, in Watchland, actually. Uh, his name is Gaetano Mileti. He's the founder of the Laboratoire Temps Fréquence. Uh, he's here to tell us about how to measure time and how to push the measure of time. Professor Mileti, welcome. Thank you very much for this uh, kind uh, introduction. It's a great pleasure, but also a great challenge uh, to present, uh, summarize our activities uh, to such uh, an audience. So first of all, a few words uh, concerning uh, myself and my laboratory. Uh, so, I'm a professor of physics at the University of Neuchâtel in Switzerland, and I'm co-founder of uh, the laboratory together with uh, Professor uh, Pierre uh, Thoman, and now uh, the laboratory uh, is also led by the successor, uh, Professor Thomas Sudmeyer. So, I've been working in this field of uh, atomic clocks since uh, 19 uh, 91, and I'm group leader since 2001. I'm mentioning uh, this task of group leader because to lead a research laboratory, even if it is a, in a university, it's a little bit like running a, a company. And uh, my specialization is a subfield of atomic clocks that I will present uh, later on, which are compact clocks, uh, space clocks, and uh, wavelength stabilized uh, lasers. So, Laboratoire Temps Fréquence, as it was said, is part of the University of Neuchâtel. Uh, it was founded in 2007, and actually our origin, myself uh, and uh, the, the other group uh, uh, of Pierre Thoman, was originally in Observatoire Cantonal de Neuchâtel. So, the Swiss uh, people know that Observatoire Cantonal de Neuchâtel is a historic uh, chronometric entity in Switzerland. It used to give the accurate time uh, within uh, Switzerland, and I will also say a few words about the history. So, coming to this conference for the first time, I ask myself, what do I share with uh, the other participants uh, to SCHH? And here are some uh, propositions of uh, answer to this question. Uh, first of all, we share our historical uh, background. Uh, we share the quest for precision in this uh, time measurement. But uh, I believe that uh, most of all, uh, we share the same passion uh, for the domain of measurement of time, a passion that is uh, strategic for this country, uh, Switzerland, of course, which is a watchmaker, watchmaking, uh, leading watchmaking uh, country, uh, but it's also central for ma mankind for at least two reasons. The first is that uh, precise time is used every day, uh, even if we are not aware of it, but also it's central for mankind because it's a central philosophical uh, point, what is time? Uh, can we go back into time? Uh, why time go, seems to go only in one direction, etc., etc. So, uh, a little bit of this common history that we have uh, scientists and uh, watchmakers, and I've tried to summarize uh, in this uh, view graph a little bit of this uh, history. Um, in the horizontal axis, I have uh, represented uh, the, the time, the date, so ranging back to 5,000 uh, uh, years uh, ago. And uh, the pictures show a few uh, examples, important examples, of devices that were used to measure accurate time. And the way to uh, quantify this accuracy is uh, shown here on the vertical axis. And uh, so, for instance, initially, uh, the uncertainty or the error in measuring time was essentially uh, a thousand seconds, which, were, which was really sufficient for the need, 
the initial need was not really to measure the hour, but rather to measure, to have a calendar in order to know when we should uh, um, uh, put some plants. And this was vital, of course, because uh, it, you would die if you choose the wrong time. And later on, the technology and the science of measuring time uh, evolved, and uh, the, this inaccuracy uh, decreased gradually. And what is very interesting with the measurement of time, that it is on one side, on one side driven by the needs, by the application. For instance, the need to measure accurately time on sea was also vital in order to determine precisely the longitude and determine the position. And uh, later on, as I will say, uh, more accurate uh, timepieces uh, appeared. Um, and the science of measuring time also changed. It went from astronomy into mechanics, science of materials, then electronics, and nowadays, uh, atomic physics, lasers, photonics, as I will explain in a few minutes. And so our field of research is up here, so it concerns atomic clocks. And in this moment, the main innovation in our field is actually this small device shown here, which is called the laser. So thanks to the lasers, we are making, making very fundamental physics, but also better clocks. And one way to realize the progress that has been done in the last uh, century is that many uh, Nobel Prizes in physics were related to the research on uh, atomic clocks. And in this research, actually, we don't uh, actually use these numbers, seconds per day of instability, in order to characterize our clocks. We uh, use another tool, which is simply a normalization of this quantity, because sometimes it's not the instability at one day that matters, but at shorter time or longer time. So if you normalize, you end up having this kind of numbers that characterize uh, your clock instability. So for instance, uh, 15 minutes would correspond to 1% error. And if we improve the stability, uh, for instance, the, the one important uh, instability uh, value is microsecond. One microsecond. Why would you care to keep one microsecond accuracy at a one-day uh, time scale? Well, you care because all networks that we are using for the internet, for the cell phone, power distribution networks, etc., would not work if they, would not, they were not synchronized at the microsecond level. And this only atomic clocks are able to do. And if we push more the accuracy, we go down to, for us, 10 to the minus 14, or one nanosecond at a day stability. Well, this is required. Why do you need one nanosecond instability? You need one nanosecond instability in order to guarantee satellite positioning. And that is why I have put here a picture of a satellite near to the picture of a boat, because it's exactly the same po uh, problem of positioning um, application of time measurement. So let's move on and uh, see what has happened during the last few hundred years. Uh, initially, the time was measured out of the rotation of Earth, so measuring accurately time meant measuring accurately the relative position of Earth in the universe. And how to do that? This is done in observatory, in observatories called chronometric observatories. For instance, the Observatoire Cantonal de Neuchâtel was founded in 1858 at the request of the watchmakers, in particular the watchmakers that were making marine chronometers and who needed uh, the certification of these of their timepieces, for instance, uh, to name them Ulysse Narda. And so the canton of Neuchâtel founded the observatory in order to measure accurately time. The instrument was this one. So here you can see the instrument in use. Uh, it was placed here in this observatory that can still be visited. There is an opening and you can observe the stars. And the two passages of the same star, it's approximately 
24 hours. Now, if you want to admire this beautiful instrument, it's the Museum of Horology in uh, La Chaux de Fonds. And of course, you don't need accurate time only once per day. You need every time. And for this, you need a second set of instruments, the garde de temps, time pieces, timekeeping pieces. Initially, it was it were pendulum, and then more uh, elaborate mechanical uh, oscillators like uh, balancier spiral, etc. Such as these ones. And uh, some of you might remember that accurate time was distributed within Switzerland from the Observatoire of Cotonal de Neuchâtel. But about 50 years ago, two revolutions happened, uh, which is uh, shown in this uh, slide. The first revolution is that the Earth, so to say, was replaced by the atoms, because in the meantime, physicists discovered a phenomenon called magnetic resonance. It's the same phenomenon that is used in magnetic resonance imaging, for instance. And they discovered that atoms can be a more stable, more accurate reference than Earth's rotation. And the second revolution is that the mechanical oscillators were surpassed in terms of stability and accuracy, not in terms of beauty, of course, as we can see here in this salon, by quartz oscillators. So instead of stabilizing mechanical oscillators using Earth, today we stabilize quartz oscillators with atoms. And several observatories, like Observatoire Cantonal de Neuchâtel, changed actually their activities. And instead of making astronomy, they started to make atomic clocks, such as these ones that were developed in the 90s in Observatoire Cantonal de Neuchâtel, rubidium atomic clocks, hydrogen masers, cesium masers. And I will say a few words in a minute uh, about how these devices work. So what is an atomic clock? It's a very simple. It is a quartz oscillator, which frequency, which is the inverse of inter time interval, is frequency stabilized using an atomic resonance through a phenomenon called the magnetic resonance that I sh summarize here with a magnetic resonance curve. More precisely, what is an atomic clock? Actually, it is, uh, sorry, it is uh, an oscillator that provides an oscillating signal, very regular one. If you count each oscillation, you get time, and which is provided to the user. And user can be somebody who wants to have accurate time, but it can be somebody also who wants just a stable frequency, like for network synchronization and satellite positioning, as I mentioned already. But this quartz oscillator is also used to drive a resonance on atoms, this magnetic resonance, and the atoms act as a regulator who give a feedback, sorry, give a, a feedback to correct the quartz if it goes too fast or too slowly. And this is exactly the principle of all atomic clocks. And based on this principle, the second was defined according to this uh, formula, this relatively complicated formula, but we can say that when the quartz is resonant with a specific transition of the atoms, cesium atoms depicted here, uh, we can say that this is the second if we count that many oscillations. And here the atoms is depicted with two energy levels, and uh, you may ask what is the link between energy and frequency, the link is uh, given by this very simple formula. The frequency is the difference of energy between these two energy levels and a fundamental constant called the Planck constant. And I just, I, I, I'm sorry for the non-scientist, uh, would like to insist on the Planck constant, which is a very important constant because uh, it is a fundamental constant which until May this year will be a constant that pe people can measure. But actually, the international uh, unit system is being reformed. Uh, there is now a, a new a change. And the value of this Planck constant, among the changes, one thing will be that the value of this fundamental constant will be fixed uh, for all. So uh, briefly, I would like, of course, to uh, mention the fact that when atomic clocks were invented in the 50s, 
Also in Neuchâtel uh, was done the pioneering work, so the pioneering work done in mechanical watches, in quartz, and also in atomic clocks. The first atomic clock in Neuchâtel was uh, uh, a, a maser, actually, an ammoniac maser, which uh, was uh, actually shown in 1958 in the Swiss pavilion of the Universal Exposition in Bruxelles. Uh, we learn by looking at, also looking at the newspaper, that in 59, Neuchâtel was the only place where there were two atomic clocks that were as good as uh, stability, which was below one microsecond per uh, day. And the interesting thing is that all these efforts were born by uh, a collaboration already at that time between uh, industrial laboratories, of course, originated by watch companies also, and uh, entities such as Observatoire de Neuchâtel and the University of Neuchâtel, of course, the Institute of Physics of Neuchâtel, and this work continues, continued over the years. And if we now jump about uh, a few decades, uh, in the 80s and 90s, arrived in Observatoire Cantonal de Neuchâtel a new director named uh, Giovanni Busca, who pushed further the effort and uh, um, wanted to develop not atomic clocks only for ground, but also atomic clocks for space, for application of space. And actually, out of this development was born the atomic clocks that are presently in space for the European version of, Galileo, of GPS, which is called Galileo. And those are the rubidium clocks that were developed at that time and that are flying now, uh, later on developed by a spin-off of Observatoire Cantonal called Spectra Time, together with uh, hydrogen masers, also developed initially in Observatoire, later on in Spectra Time. I move on in this evolution of measurement of time uh, and uh, would like to uh, be a little bit more precise about these different types of atomic clocks that I named and how they work, very briefly. So this is a picture of a thermal cesium beam atomic clock. Actually, the cesium beam is produced here and the atoms go in a, a few milliseconds through a magnetic cavity. That's where the magnetic resonance takes place. And this is one type of uh, atomic clocks. And here, the research presently uh, that we also do in collaboration with another company in Neuchâtel called Osseo Quartz is to build up the new generation of atomic clocks where we introduce this new technology that I mentioned already, uh, the lasers. Uh, here, I would like to highlight the fact that Neuchâtel is the only place in the world where you have several laboratories and several companies developing all atomic clocks. The, after this development, uh, new innovations appeared. We could manipulate, as we say, atoms with lasers, and out of it was developed what is called the cold cesium primary fontaine. This is the work realized by my former colleague, Professor Pierre Thoman, and then continued by his successor, Professor uh, Sudmayer, and in close collaboration with the Swiss National Metrological Institute called METAS. And now this device has been put in operation. You may have seen press release a few weeks ago. Uh, Switzerland, thanks to this device, contributes to the international time. Another variant of atomic clocks is a hydrogen maser. I already mentioned this. This is a picture of a hydrogen maser developed initially in observatoire, then in spectra time, to go on the International Space Station. So not only for the navigation, but also for fundamental physics on the International Space Station. The hydrogen, maser, uh, the hydrogen molecules are produced here, broken into atoms, and then they go in a bulb in which takes place the magnetic resonance. And more my field of research, we go even more compact. Now the atoms are stored in the glass cell, these are rubidium atoms. There is a vapor of atoms here that we use as a reference to stabilize the uh, quartz oscillator. And presently, the research in this field is to push further the miniaturization, replace this glass-blown cell by a microfabricated cell. And here you see an example 
of such cells realized in collaboration with the EPFL the, and its antenna in Neuchâtel, uh, MacroCity, and also with CSEM, another important uh, research institute uh, in this field. And so the idea is to make what we call a chip-scale atomic clock, and who knows, maybe one day will be integrated uh, in a watch. But the research continues. We want to do better than the nanosecond. And how to do better? I will uh, simplify uh, the, the whole idea by using a term that watchmakers know. The name is quality factor. The quality factor, it is what characterizes the resonance. Uh, it's defined uh, uh, by the ratio uh, between the uh, resonance uh, frequency and its width. And one way to increase the quality factor is to increase the frequency at which takes place the resonance. In the present definition of the second, the resonance of the cesium atoms is in the microwave region, 10 to the 9 hertz. And if we now use a resonance in the optical domain, called terahertz, we can go up to 10 to the minus 14, which means we can increase the quality factor by five orders of magnitude, which means now the instability can go down to the 10 to the minus 18 level. These are incredible numbers. This is being realized, and these are pictures taken in the laboratory of my colleague uh, Thomas Sudmeyer at uh, the Laboratoire Temps Fréquence. You can see that it is not miniaturized yes, yet, but, uh, and it's made of what we call optical tables, tables in which there are lasers and mirrors and all kind of optical uh, components. You can see here uh, an optical cavity, so a cavity that resonates, but not in the microwave region, but in the optical region. And slowly, we are realizing uh, this dream of increasing further the atomic clock uh, frequency and improving the frequency. I've mentioned here in the title, optical comb. Why we need an optical comb? Uh, it is simply because the user needs a very low frequency. So even if the clock frequency, the atoms resonate at a very high frequency, you need some clockwork, some uh, engrenage, like in the mechanical clutch, uh, watches, in order to connect this high frequency with low frequency, uh, thanks to an invention which is called optical comb, which deserved the Nobel Prize in physics a few years ago, this link could be done, and the dramatic improvement of these devices could be done. Let's uh, see how dramatic, I use the word dramatic, how important was this improvement. I try to summarize in this figure. Again, I apologize to the non-scientist. So here you see the last 60 years, and here you see uh, the relative instability. In the previous graph, the better clocks were going up. In this graph, because I do the inverse, it, they go down. But that's the same. So you can see that initially we had a fraction of microseconds of instability uh, with the first atomic clocks in the 50s, and those could be improved down to the 10 to the minus 15, so below one nanosecond at a day, by improving, uh, in particular, the manipulation of atoms with lasers, laser cooling. These are all um, inventions that deserved Nobel Prizes in physics. But in the last decade, it kind of saturated here at 10 to the minus 14 level. But thanks to optical clocks and optical combs, you see here that the improvement went much, much faster. And actually, nowadays, uh, if we measure an optical clock against the reference, we get these red dots here, which are not limited by the clock that we are developing, they are limited by the reference. So we are in a kind of absurd situation in which the definition of the second is not as accurate as the best clock that we are doing. And so that is why uh, we are interested in two, comparing now the optical clocks with other optical clocks, and we realize that their accuracy or instability is better than the reference. But we cannot say really their accuracy because the reference is the reference. And that is why nowadays, in the entity, international entity in charge of this question, the Bureau International des Poids et Mesures, 
is in discussion a change of the definition of the second, because uh, the second uh, soon, soon for such questions means maybe in 10, 15 years, uh, will be defined as uh, something that is no more out of the cesium atoms, but on something else, could be iterbium ions or whatsoever. So it's uh, time now to uh, conclude and say, let you know what are the perspectives in uh, our field. Uh, so the first conclusion I would like to make is that this fantastic journey in science, in technology, and I, I, I like to say for uh, humans, uh, research continues. It's a very exciting, so it's interesting to look what happened in the past, but maybe the best things are still to come. Uh, these improvements are coming from the results of scientific research, of course, from innovations, but also they are driven by applications. And this is one of the beauties of our field, is that there are plenty of applications, applications that we have already in mind, but applications that we didn't know, that we don't know yet. Again, when people invented a nuclear magnetic resonance, they didn't know uh, all the applications that would come. And so we should be aware of this when we do fundamental research. And one important application nowadays of atomic clocks is a big data, the so-called big data, all the, this data that must be transmitted at a very high speed uh, and also a very high number and uh, need to be synchronized. And this is one uh, modern application of atomic clocks. And also, again, the most important, that's why I've shown uh, one heart here, because it kind of symbolizes our heart of researchers. It's a combination of, passion, of passions. On one hand, it's a passion for metrology, for accuracy, measuring time accurately. But also, it is a passion for fundamental research. And in our case, fundamental research is quantum, what is called nowadays quantum technology. In fact, if we look here at basic building blocks of our atomic clocks, it's a piece of atoms, some source of uh, photons, lasers are source of uh, light particles called photons, and uh, some clockwork around. This is actually technology, but this is more precisely quantum technology, and this quantum technology cannot, uh, is not only used to measure time, it can be used for other applications, and this is being recognized now at an uh, international level, and for instance, has been launched very recently a European uh, quantum, a so-called quantum flagship, uh, and in particular, one project uh, that is coordinated uh, in Neuchâtel by, by CSCM called the Maximal, in which we aim at using our uh, know-how developed for atomic clocks for other applications, such as quantum sensors. Quantum sensors means quantum uh, sensing of magnetic field, of rotation, etc., using uh, this quantum device, but also the quantum internet, quantum uh, uh, computing, uh, uh, etc., etc. And so there are very uh, exciting uh, perspectives for this uh, field of research. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and uh, thank uh, all my colleagues from Laboratoire Temps Fréquence. Uh, for uh, sharing with me uh, all this work uh, during these years. Thank you very much. Let me ask you a question. Uh, you have consulted or collaborated with Urwerk in their atomic clock project, uh, which actually presented here last year, and it was an empty case. It was kind of a promise. Yes. Uh, we're going to put an atomic watch into this small thing that looked like you know, half a shoebox, something like that, maybe a full shoebox, but that kind of size. That means that basically we can have an atomic clock in our home now. Can yes. you just say a few words about that specific atomic clock and how is it different from what you've shown here? Some of them were actually, you know, Pretty closet big. size, room <laughs> yes. size. Yes, yes, the atomic clock that are in the Urwerk uh, device are actually the ones that I've shown. Just move away from the slide. Sorry. Yeah. Very quickly. Sorry. Where are they? <laughs> yeah. Ah, here they are. It is a. It is a clock. 
like this one. Okay. It is a rubidium atomic clock. The atoms are stored in a cell. And this is, so it's a, it's a clock like this. And the box that you have seen, actually, the parts contained by, that contains the clock, it's, it's not the, may, the most, the, the, the yeah. largest part. And now we are developing chip scale atomic clocks, so which are one cubic centimeter okay. clock. This is the next challenge. Uh, is it a challenge as a, 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 a 5, 10, 15 years, as you said before, or it's, is it a shorter term challenge? It's already a, a product, not one cubic centimeter, but okay. a few cubic centimeter. Okay. It's a product okay. nowadays. So today we can have an atomic clock in our home. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you for coming and sharing your expertise and knowledge. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. And this ends the program of uh, the day, so I'm going to say goodbye to everybody here and everybody who has been watching online. Tomorrow, Thursday, last day of uh, SIHH, is also the day where in the afternoon, starting at 3 p.m., the salon is open to the public. Uh, but we start at 12 with uh, our first session of the program of uh, tomorrow. For, nine, for now, goodbye and enjoy the evening. Bye-bye. <laughs>